Greetings, greetings, greetings. Welcome to So Much To Talk About. My name is Nabate Isles, and it's always a pleasure to share facts and viewpoints on the world of sports. And this week is no different. I'm going to have a wonderful guest that uh, that is one of the best in the business for sure. And I'm going to introduce him in one second. But before I do, make sure to check out past episodes of So Much To Talk About on my YouTube channel. N is a no, S is a Sam, I is an indigo world, NSI world, my YouTube channel where it has past interviews and past episodes of So Much To Talk About. Now, Without further ado, I want to introduce this gentleman who is one of the best voices in the business, play by play. And he has been with ESPN for, wow, he's been there for since 1999. So it's been 22 years. And he's um, ESPN, you know, he joined ESPN as a, a Sports Center update anchor and has elevated himself to be the lead play by play voice for the NBA on ESPN radio. And he also does commentary for ESPN radio's NFL, college football and college basketball broadcasts. And he is called so many different events in the world of sports. And, and it's such a pleasure. And he's not just one of the great professionals in the business, but one of the great individuals, human beings in this business. It's my pleasure to introduce Mr. Mark Kestisher on So Much To Talk About. How are you, sir? Good to see you. It's great to be on your show. It's great to uh, talk to you again. We had a lot of back and forth over the years. We would yes. always cross paths across yes. the country, wherever we were, uh, mainly in the NBA world. So uh, I might owe you a dinner based on that uh, introduction <laughs> there. I can't believe I've been with ESPN since the last century. This is crazy. <laughs> And you know what? But that shows like your excellence. They know that you want you one of their most valued assets for sure. And just listening to NBA on ESPN radio is just it's soothing to hear your voice and, and the expertise you bring is, is unbelievable. Well, I appreciate that. I, I was very fortunate to um, maybe a year or two into arriving there filling in as a studio host on a random Sunday night baseball game. I think it was Yankees Red Sox. Ah, uh, <laughs> fitting. fitting, very fitting, and uh, I think Pedro Martinez struck out seventeen, if I'm if I'm not mistaken. Ooh. But my the boss of ESPN Radio Play by Play at the time, his ears kind of perked up, and he's like, "Who's this guy?" And wow. so that's where it all started, and then it kind of got into play by play. And I don't know how we got to this point, but uh, I've I've just been very fortunate to have this position, and really the last five years of uh, being the main NBA play by play voices like a dream come true. And I just hope it keeps going. Yes. So oh, no doubt about that. And I want to ask you how, how I always ask my guests, you know, how are you and your family dealing with this COVID-19 pandemic and the change that it's made in sports media for sure? Well, thanks for asking. My wife uh, is a dental hygienist, which is a very, very difficult job <laughs> in the pandemic. So she, she stepped away. She's been doing it for 30 years and it's actually been a nice break for her, though. She doesn't want to retire yet. She'd like to go back. She has one more vaccine shot to go, and she's hoping to get back to work. And my daughter, who is 23 now, I know you've known her since she was a lot smaller, <laughs> graduated college last spring uh, online because, you know, her last couple months were uh, right. in the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And she's a theater major, so uh, there's not much theater going on at the moment. Uh, fortunately, she's able to put up with the two of us of her parents and we kind of get along <laughs> well, the dynamic great. So um, I, I know I'm not a huge cook, but I know in the last few months we've been making a lot of cool meals that we've never made before. And neither of us were really handy around the kitchen. So we've gotten better at it. It's just, you know, we take a very, very difficult time, which has been bad for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. It's been okay for us. Um, you know, I, I have a contract at ESPN. Mm -hmm. There's still, uh, even though I was in the NBA bubble in the fall, I've done mostly all of my work from the Bristol studios, which are a half hour from my house. So all in all, in a very bad situation for the world, it hasn't been too terrible for us and um, just fortunate to have the job. Wow. And please give my regards to your wife and your daughter for sure. Absolutely. I will. You know, definitely. And um, wow. Now, speaking of the bubble, how was that experience and how like it was the safest place you can ever be from what, you know, yeah. I mean, it's great. No one was in, no one was affected at all. Like they, you would think that others people would follow suit or maybe the NBA should do it again. But I mean, how was that experience for you? Well, uh, as a Disney employee to be able to say the happiest place on earth was the safest place on earth is absolutely <laughs> accurate. Um, it was interesting for us. There were two different tiers, the players, the coaches, and the very few cameramen 
uh, and some sideline reporters, they were in the tier that was getting tested every day, uh, was in the hotels near the players. The media, we were about 70 feet off the court. There was plexiglass in front of us. We stayed at a different hotel. Initially, we were getting tested every three days. Eventually, it bumped up to every day. Um, and I was able to go home a couple times. I didn't really lock in until the final five uh, weeks because mm -hmm. the incoming testing wasn't like the players who had to be there for a week to quarantine. We quarantined for 24 hours. Okay. So I was able to uh, you know, leave and come back because we tag teamed with a couple of different radio crews. But it was, um, it was outstandingly run. It looked great on television. It sounded great on radio. I mean, our access was limited for what we were used to, but it's now kind of the norm this year. All of our interviews were on Zoom with coaches. We had very little access to players, um, but, you know, we made do and uh, we made it sound right. We crowned a champ, the NBA crowned a champ, and we went from there. And it wasn't it wasn't too bad. A lot of people asked, well, how, how'd you do for five straight weeks? Or some people were there for three months, mm -hmm. you know, three and a half months. A lot of the tech people who were in my hotel, um, it was it was a five star hotel with a giant pool and a golf course attached to it. Uh, you know, it it really wasn't that bad. The best part was it was hoops every day. I did both conference finals because there was no travel mm -hmm. and the NBA finals. That'll never happen again. That was just fun. Me, Doris Burke, PJ Carlissimo, every day. It was like Groundhog Day. Wake up, interview coaches, prep for the game, go to the arena, and uh, it was it was a lot of fun. It really was. Wow, no, absolutely. And here with Mark Kestisher, uh, the voice of NBA on ESPN Radio, and uh, one of the great play-by-play -play voices in all of the land. Uh, here on so much to talk about. My name is Nabate Al. So, Mark, wow, now. You know, there's a lot to talk about now with what's going on going into the 2021 playoffs. But we had the trade deadline, you know, that happened uh, like a few days ago. It ended. So talk about like which team you felt uh, made the best move to be able to possibly move another round further in the NBA playoffs with the move they made. Well, first of all, I was asked a few days before the trade deadline, we gonna have a lot of trades this year. And I'm like, well, they added a few more teams to the playoff structure. There's a play in. Mm -hmm. So I said, I don't think we're going to have as many trades as we usually have. And then I wrote it down <laughs> here. We had 46 players traded at the deadline. That's right. Line. And 30 was the so previous it, mark, right? 30, I believe. It, yes. yes, it did. It's, <laughs> it's the most ever. So I, I mean, what do I know? Now, what I didn't take into account was the maneuvering that general managers do as far as, opening up a roster spot, getting below the luxury tax, mm -hmm. where now you're looking at buyout or you're looking at cap space for next year. So some of it is for now, some of it is for later. And I think, you know, it's an opportunity uh, to take advantage, if you will, of teams who think, hey, maybe we can make a little extra run here. Mm -hmm. I think uh, Denver, uh, you know, their acquisition of Aaron Gordon, mm -hmm. certainly big, uh, because that's a team that hasn't played up to its uh, potential this year. Uh, you know, for me, it's it's always the extra parts. Like, and you know, in this league right now, shooting is gold. It's premium. That's so, right. You know, even a guy like J.J. Redick, who hasn't performed to his ability this year, who's been injured, um, you know, the last number of weeks, mm -hmm. you know, where he goes could end up being a big deal. And he ended up going to Dallas. So maybe that gives them a little depth on the edge, which they lost when uh, Seth Curry was traded to Philadelphia. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't know where the big... Uh, you know, trade in the end is going to go down. Will it be Victor Oladipo playing like his old self, his pre-injured self in Miami, who may also get LaMarcus Aldridge very soon in the cool. buyout market. Yep. So there's still, it, it's interesting because I remember last year with the Miami Heat in the bubble and you looked at, um, you know, their roster, like an Andre Iguodala who came over in a mid-season trade, a Jay Crowder who came over in a mid-season trade. And it transforms your team to where you forget how that team performed last year, you know, in normal years, you go two thirds of the season mm -hmm. and now you're looking at the trade deadline here. We're, you know, just over the halfway point. So that's a long way to say, I think Denver improved themselves. Um, I think Dallas improved themselves. Clippers will be interesting to see, you know, Rondo, Lou Williams, if that's a straight up trade one team, you know, took the worst of it or not. Um, but I don't know if there was a straight over the top. This is the team to win it. Cause you still think the Brooklyn Nets, when they made the Harden trade months ago, that was huge, you know, for them. And the Lakers kind of stood pat at the deadline. They had limited options. Anyway, they're going to look into the buyout market. So I'm not sure if there was one that stands out, but for me, Denver, knowing the talent that they have, 
um, you know, and adding a, a player of, uh, you know, the capabilities of Aaron Gordon, perhaps that that's, that's one for me that I'm keeping an eye on. Yes, indeed. And he can guard three positions, could guard the two, three, and four, which is really that versatility. Mm-hmm. You know, he, he's like, he could be there, Jeremy Grant, you know, basically, you know, that's like, a you big know, loss for them. That turned out to be a huge loss yes. for them. Uh, you know, with Grant signing with Detroit. So her, perhaps that's been part of their missing uh, what they've missed from last year. And, and a very underrated uh, acquisition, JaVale McGee. In a because JaVale McGee had his best season in Denver, actually, you know, and that's and right. then and now he's much more mature with having three championships playing in Golden State and then playing with LeBron in LA. He could he could be able to do more than what Mason Plumley because they miss Mason Plumley, he can end up doing a little more too. Well, I well. you know, when, when you look at the Lakers and look, when the Lakers are healthy, you know, mm-hmm. they're probably the team to beat, mm-hmm. but the one thing the Lakers are missing this year was that combination of JaVale McGee and Dwight Howard because you know the NBA now, it is a spread offense. The defense is stretched and you need those guys to protect the rim. And and both both uh, JaVale and Dwight, I don't want to call them mercurial. I put <laughs> JaVale maybe more in that category. Yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, you just don't know. He doesn't, he doesn't show you a lot, but on the floor, that's mm-hmm. his game. And he's yeah. a shot blocker and he's a rim protector and he's athletic and he can get out from side to side. So I, I think you're right that that may be a very under the radar pick for the Nuggets as well as as they look to deepen that roster and make a run in the West. Wow. And now the Brooklyn Nets, I mean, when they acquired James Harden, there were so many people that were ripping this trade. And I've always said about James that James is not selfish. James is asked to do from coaching he's whatever he's asked to do he does it at a high level so he was asked to be an iso player then before that year when he led the league in assists he was asked to do that and he did it so with james now showing that capability with the brooklyn nets wow how much pressure is on this team when kd and kyrie come back for the playoffs like how much pressure is on this team to win it all not just win the east yeah, I, th- I think they're de- it's a small window. It's really a, a two-year window to me uh, for the Brooklyn Nets. And I agree, agree with you, first off, is I, I think James, I don't want to say soured me. His game kind of soured me on realizing his basketball brilliance mm-hmm. because it wasn't a very pleasing game to watch. The isolation game, all the dribbling, late shot clock. But, you know, the step back three has transformed the game. Yes. And then just his ability to get to the rim and get fouled and – kind of almost manipulate the officials a little bit in the way his body moves and how strong he is and how durable he is. I have grown so much more of an appreciation for James Harden this year based on what I had thrown on him and how they played in Houston under Mike D'Antoni. So I'm glad it's kind of an eye opening for a lot of us. And we talked about it the other night when we were broadcasting the Brooklyn Utah game, even though none of the big three were there. Um, John Barry and I were just discussing like, you know, James Harden legit, MVP candidate. I mean, he has put his name in. A lot of that is because some of the other guys we've talked about are injured, whether it's Mm -hmm. Embiid in Philadelphia or LeBron James in Los Angeles. Um, You know, and Jokic doesn't get talked enough, but he's obviously legit MVP candidate as well. But Harden, if he um, stays mostly healthy and Brooklyn ends up winning the East, uh, he's going to get as as many votes as anyone. But I do think it reminds me of the Clippers a little bit last year in that Mm-hmm. we knew on paper the Clippers were the best team and we kept saying all year if they just get healthy nobody's beating the Clippers yeah. and they never got healthy and mm-hmm. I hope Kevin Durant is going to be the Kevin Durant we saw the first few months healthy of the season mentally not just and physically mentally. but mentally because I the hope PC. Kyrie same mm-hmm. thing with Kyrie Irving I, I hope he's bought in and maybe he will come playoff time but if those three play together and it's stunning Seven games, six and a half, if you include, because Durant was pulled off the floor when he yes. was contact traced. <laughs> right. So if those guys get together and actually play together, um, I don't know if it's the pressure, which was your original question, the pressure to win. The window to me is the pressure, because here you go, guys. You got a two-year window to win a couple of championships. Mm-hmm. But I think if they if they get healthy and play to their abilities, I don't know who beats them. I mean, I, I would love healthy Lakers, health, healthy Nets. That would be an awesome series to me. And I don't know who wins that series. Yeah, that's for sure. And, 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 and speaking of the Western Conference, the Utah Jazz has been, they've been tremendous this year. I mean, Rudy Gobert, I think, and I've always said this, and people have said that I'm crazy, but he's the most important player on that team. 
There's no question about it because he lets, he frees everyone else like a Donovan Mitchell to do what they need to do. And then Donovan doesn't have to really be on defense that much because they have that stifled tower right there to protect the rim and, and to, and to help. Um, but Utah, this seems like an opportunity for for them with the Lakers having injury problems and we don't know how healthy AD and LeBron will be coming back and then PG and, and Kawhi, we don't know what's going to happen with them. So Utah, this could be their best opportunity to get in. Can they do it? Like, like what's the probability of them doing it? Yeah, you know, I hate to see a team peak early. That's always, you know, an issue and they got off to a great start and then they hit their low. But, you know, I had a chance to deep dive into it because we did their game and we talked to Quinn Snyder, uh, you know, for about 15 minutes before oh, the game. They were genius, on the road. Genius. Yeah, coach, he, he yeah. is. He really is. Mm-hmm. And they were on the road for two and a half, three weeks around the All-Star break. They only had maybe one home game over a month. Mm-hmm. And now they're in a stretch where they have a, a schedule against teams they should beat all in Salt Lake City. So they're going to pad this lead in the West, which is, mm-hmm. you know, right about three games over Phoenix right now and uh, three and a half over the Clippers. Right. I think the Lakers are down to five. So so they're going to have that number one. Now, I don't know if home court has makes any sense this year because I don't know how much crowd eventually is going to let in. We all know Salt Lake City is like the great crowd if they could have it. But comfortability, comfortability yeah. for the that players. Is very, mm-hmm. That is, it's hey Donovan Mitchell spoke about. It. He's like, I just enjoyed getting in my car and driving around mm-hmm. for a couple hours. Like I, these guys are in their hotel rooms for almost the entirety of the road trips. I mean, they're not allowed to go anywhere anymore. That's so right. it's it's a freeing feeling uh, to being home. And you mentioned it. Uh, um, I think he's going to win Defensive Player of the Year this year. Rudy Gobert, mm-hmm. Donovan Mitchell's numbers are up. Um, they've got at last check, four guys, all over a hundred, three point, three Ooh. pointers made. Joe Ingles is on fire oh. from three and Clarkson. Mike six Conley. Man. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. Clarkson is a six man Conley to win, you know, a chance to win a championship, finally an all-star. So all that is to say they're a really good team. They do it differently. Mm-hmm. You know, they, they can shoot from outside and they can defend the rim and they can play in the post. They got Derek favors back. So, you know, you got favors and go bear, which you don't have a lot of big guys in the league anymore. So mm-hmm. they can play at all three levels. They have an outstanding coach um, and there's injuries in the West. So yes, I think this could finally be the year uh, for Utah to get back for the first time since uh, the Stockton and Malone years in the late nineties. Yeah. And, and, and you made a good point with saying that the crowds, you know, the difference of home court, and that could be the thing. Cause you know, the NBA likes to have big markets. I'm not, I'm not speculating anything, you know, but they like to have big <laughs> markets to be in the finals. So this year may not make a difference. You know, Utah could, you know, when they get in, they won't be frowned or shunned upon, you know, cause of course it didn't make a difference in 97, 98. Cause you had MJ. So MJ right there brings all the cachet to, the finals and everything like that but it's 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 interesting you know from that standpoint and um you know the fact that these are best of sevens like we're in the midst of march madness right now and so anybody can beat anybody in one game and a lot of teams are not great at the beginning of best of seven series the the toronto raptors used to lose game one all the time (laughs) and you know they finally put it together a couple years ago to win a championship because you got to win the best of seven so the team's uh, it's cliche, but the teams that make the adjustments, um, you know, that can outlast you. Those are the, that's where Utah has, you know, typically fallen short these last few years. It's where they fell short last year against the Denver Nuggets. Mm-hmm. Um, it feels to me that they got just about everybody back. Uh, they have been among the healthiest teams in the league. Again, I don't want them to peak early. They've been healthy for, you know, 60% of the season. We got 40% and then two months of playoffs. It's a long way to go. But if they can keep it the way they've done it to this point and have the same guys every night and keep that health, then uh, they, they have a great chance this year to win it. That would be key for sure. And, and uh, the surprise team, the team that can come out of the playing round and be able to make some noise, because like you mentioned, once again, about home court, may not be a big enough factor, which like seven to 10 team in the West or East can come in and maybe win a round or possibly two and make the conference yeah. finals. <laughs> I tend to lean West because the bottom of the East is a little weak right now. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I mean, Miami and Boston are at the bottom of the East and they haven't hit on all cylinders this year for whatever reason. Now maybe you reconfigured Miami as a team you don't want to mess with um, Boston. I can't quite put my finger on why they haven't been, 
good enough. And I don't think it, there's three teams in the East, really. I mean, Philly, Brooklyn, Milwaukee, those to me, the class by far. So in the West, you know, if the Mavericks can get it together, I thought they had made some strides last year. They took a big step back. I know health was an issue. COVID was an issue. So Dallas would be a team. I always underestimate San Antonio. And, you know, now there's no LaMarcus Aldridge and you don't know who's playing there for pop anymore, but they still win. Yeah, so, right. <laughs> so who knows? I mean, Golden State with a, a healthy Curry and, and Draymond, I just don't think they have enough depth, but they certainly have the pedigree. And then the other team would be the Memphis Grizzlies, who um, I thought would take that step this year and they just haven't. Yeah. So probably of those four teams I just mentioned, it would probably be the Mavericks in both conferences that may end up playing in that play in a team you don't want to see in uh, in round one of the playoffs. Wow. And John Moran, I think he's chomping at the bit to show yeah. because, I mean, his athleticism, what that dunk he did a few days ago, that left hand, I w and, and the ease, that was one of the greatest alley-oop dunks. I mean, it ranks up there with, with Gerald Green. Gerald Green's windmill, too. Yeah. Like, those are the yeah. two greatest. Like, what an entertainer John Moran is. <laughs> Greek athlete. I remember um, when he first came on all of our radars, I, I didn't really know him when he was a freshman at Murray, but as a sophomore, that's when we took Shut note. Of, and, mm -hmm. and I remember he had some great dunks and then there was uh, someone took a video of their pregame warmup. And I want to say it was in the NCAA tournament might wow. even be here in Connecticut because they played in Hartford. That's right. That, I was there. I was there. Yeah. For the first that round was, game. Yeah. Yep. Oh. Hey, right? oh, no. It was against uh, Marquette. 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 There you yep, go. Yep. Mm -hmm. And um, somebody took, I'm assuming it was a video camera footage from behind mm -hmm. of that little uh, thing that they would do where they'd all get together. They'd part the Red Sea and John Morant would come up, grab the ball and all in slow motion. And at his size, I mean, he's about my size. He's like six three, and you know, his arm is at the top of the square. And it was just so majestic and awesome to see. And I love his size for the position that he plays and his athleticism. And he's a smart, smart player too. So you hope that at some point it's a very young team. And I love their coach too. I hope they could all get it together at some point and be able to make a run here and grow together. Well, absolutely. Here with Mark Kestisher on So Much to Talk About, the voice of NBA on ESPN Radio, one of the best play-by-play -play broadcasters in the business. My name is Nabate Owls. And now, Mark, you know, this show will air. Uh, we don't know what will happen with the NCAA tournament, but by the time the show airs, it'll be, but I have to ask because you are a Syracuse, Syracuse University graduate and <laughs> What like Jim Beheim? It seems like generation after ge decade after decade after decade after decade, his teams like he finds a way to always advance in the NCAs. And I think he'll be the first coach if he does it, and hopefully he does, because Coach Beheim was a, a guest on my Where They At podcast. So I gotta give Coach Beheim love awesome. for joining the show. And what a great man! But he could be the first coach, I believe, to lead a team to the final four for five decades, you know, if he does it this year, like, so wow. Talk about Syracuse and how they're able to always turn it around. And what does coach Beheim do to be able to get them really focused at this time of the year? Well, I never bring props to my interviews, but my bracket is here. And, uh, <laughs> it's like most of the brackets around the country, there's a lot of red ink. Uh, they're <laughs> But I have Syracuse, shocker, going to the Elite Eight. So okay. I, I did pick them to win uh, three games in the tournament, and they can prove me right uh, if they have beaten Houston by the time folks get a chance to see this. Mm -hmm. It is stunning to me when I arrived on the Syracuse University campus in the fall of 1986 wow. that Jim Beheim had already been there for a decade. Wow, DC. He'd already been there for a decade. Was that DC's first year? Yeah, they went oh, to the Oh, so you got campus. there right now. Wow. Okay, yeah. yeah. Kirk Coleman was there. Sherman Douglas was there. Oh, Ronnie Cycli, who's a great Cycli DJ. Now Art he's a great was, Yeah. <laughs> Eddie Thompson was there. Yes, that's right. Wow. And my freshman year was the year that Indiana beat Syracuse on the Keith Smart jump yeah. shot. Yep. And, yep. and my first year in broadcasting in 1990, I was the radio voice of the Albany Patroons in the Continental Basketball Association. Was Phil? No, that was after Phil. Phil, Phil was, was there in the 80s. Phil, right. Phil was when I was in high school in the okay. 80s. Phil Musselman, while I was in college, 
And then while I worked there, George Carl was the head coach and <laughs> Terry Scotts was his assistant coach. What lineage? So My God. It's a cr cradle of coaches in Albany, New York. <laughs> but I remember one of my first games was in Rapid City, South Dakota. And Keith Smart and Stevie Thompson were both on the Rapid City team. And I remember how wow. odd that was for me to see a guy that I followed all those years at Syracuse against the guy who ripped our hearts out. And, then I, and one of my first NBA broadcasts was a Golden State Warriors game when uh, Keith Smart was uh, the head coach. I think he was the interim coach at mm -hmm. the time. So those guys always cross. But back to your original point. On Jim Beheim, the fact that he's been there for four decades, um, I don't know what it is about the teams that barely make it onto the field onto the into the field of 64 now 68 uh that he gets the best out of i think knowing with all the games i've worked with pj carlissimo as a coach's mentality mm -hmm. he's drilled into me that the, the two three zone or the three two however they run it's mostly two three mm -hmm. it is so hard for that second game so if it's round two or elite eight regional final mm -hmm. when you only have a day to prepare for that zone it is so incredibly tough. So most times, you know, it's not a huge upset when they win in round one. But then it's that team they catch two days later who's not prepared for the zone. So now you're in the Sweet 16. Mm -hmm. And teams have had all week to prepare for that zone. But now the, the Syracuse team has confidence. And they got players. So they win that game. And then you catch the next game guy on uh, one day on the zone. So it's just they play it differently. I don't know if that's the cause and effect. Mm -hmm. But um, he's an outstanding coach. I'm stunned he's still going in his late seventies. It's awesome to see yes. him coaching his son who, yes. when I, when they won the championship in 2003, I went to the first two regionals we were in Boston and in Albany, New York. And I had a ticket to new Orleans for the final four, mm -hmm. but my dopey best friend decided to get married and didn't look at the schedule and got married on final four weekend. Oh. So I could, and I was in his party i was a groomsman so i couldn't go i had a watchman 2003 i had a watchman <laughs> in my coat my tux pocket i pulled out the watchman like you know like it was a brick phone from yeah, right. the 1990s to watch <laughs> syracuse texas in the national semi and uh you know they just every once in a while they've got some really good players and buddy Bayheim right now is shooting the heck out of the ball yes indeed and yes, uh, I wouldn't put it past Houston's a really good team. So yeah. I don't know. As folks are watching us, I have no idea how it went, but right. I think it'll be a lot of fun. That's right. And, and, and Mark, but the championship game was on a Monday night. It was. Yeah, you know, so. I, you're right. I could have went. I could have. I, I recall there was an ice storm and I might have had trouble. Right. But but I did have a friend. There was an ice storm up here and you, in uh, in the Northeast. No, you're right. So you're I, right. Had, I remember that. You're right. Right. You remember it was a really bad one. Yeah, it, 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 uh, but but I think my wife also at that point was looking at me kind of side eye like you just went to four games. Is that enough? Can you watch it on TV? So, <laughs> so I didn't get to New Orleans, which is unfortunate. But I did win my bracket. The only time I won my bracket was 2003. 2003. Oh my and I took Carmelo Anthony and the Syracuse Orange. Before I let you go, it's, it's so great to have you on. Um, so much to talk about and such an honor and, and good to, 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 to consider you a friend as well, you know, for Absolutely. sure. And uh, wow, so now, um, what's your best advice for young students looking to break into the sports media business? Your best advice? Because I speak with a lot of prospective broadcast journalism students and I look at how I began my career versus how things are going now. And mm -hmm. it's completely different in many ways. You know, tech technology, number one. Mm -hmm. um, there's not as many jobs out there. There were a ton of baseball minor league jobs and you could go wherever um, to start your career. So, the, so we have differences how we get the jobs. You know, online is tremendously different versus, you know, we used to get the uh, radio and records magazine or, yes. you know, broadcast magazine and look at the back at all the jobs listings and then send something in the mail on a cassette <laughs> tape, you know, it, everything's changed. You know, now I'm getting sound clouds from people the same day, you know, like two <laughs> seconds later, here's my reel, take a look. So the best advice I always give them because it is apples to oranges versus how I got in versus how they're getting in 30 years later is take any job, look at, you know, don't look down on any discipline. Right now, everyone wants a podcast. And uh, many want to be play by play. 
but there are jobs open, you know, whether it's at ESPN where you can, uh, you know, be a producer, an associate producer, mm -hmm. you can talk show side, you can go highlight side, you know, just get experience and network. So I'm always like, uh, take any job and go anywhere. You know, a lot of people are afraid to, if you grew up in the New York City area of getting outside of the region. And I, you know, I was fortunate. I worked in Albany, New York, which was right where I grew up. Mm -hmm. right out of Syracuse, mm -hmm. which was two hours away. Yeah. And then I went to Cleveland, Ohio, which was my first kind of branching out. Mm -hmm. But I was ready to go to Seattle. I remember there was a job in Butte, Montana. I wish I could have <laughs> done, I wish I could have done the Al Michaels and, uh, you know, went to Hawaii and worked, you know, triple A baseball there or whatever. But it's always go anywhere, do anything, meet people. And then the most important thing is be as nice to the people on the way up as they'll be nice to you on the way down because we're all going to have that arc of up and down That's so right. you know treat everyone with great respect and it's a very competitive business you know mm -hmm. uh you know you get stabbed in the back every five seconds and uh you, you just you try to survive that and uh be a gracious winner when you get the job and so you know that's what i always tell them take anything go anywhere well absolutely and and one last question for you sir um the most memorable game, the, the game that <laughs> resonates to your mind that you ever called in your illustrious career. Early on at ESPN radio and play by play, I got a call from my boss mm -hmm. and the Yankees and the Tampa Bay Rays had to play uh, a game 163 to decide the American league East. Okay. And it, it, was, it was the Rays who were in contention. Yankees were already in. So mm -hmm. Um, it was the Rays and the Red Sox in two separate games playing for a wild card. And he didn't have an announcer for radio that night. And he called me the night before and he goes, I need to send you to Tampa Bay. When's the last time you did baseball? And I said, well, I, I did a couple innings with my buddy who does single A a few months ago. But prior to that, I hadn't done it in 25 years. So wow. he goes, you want to do it? And I'm like, absolutely, absolutely. I'll do it. Mm -hmm. So I go down to Tampa. And I'm a huge Yankee fan. And so that's easy. I, I got the Yankee covered. Tampa Bay, they're in the AL East. I see them all the time. Easy. Mm -hmm. And that was the night the Tampa Bay Rays were down eight to nothing. They rallied in the ninth inning. And then in the bottom of the 12th, Evan Longoria, Longoria. hit a walk-off home run on a laser shot that just got over the, the, the uh, wall down the left field line. There's a little cutout by the pole. And they go to the postseason, and I nailed the call. I've wow. heard it in you know other promos, and so I never think of that as a defining moment because it was so early in my career. But uh -huh. that has to be for many reasons: the timing, what it meant. I actually got the call right, and I hadn't done a baseball game in like twenty-five years for <laughs> real. And here I am calling it. So to me, I think that ranks up there, if not my number one moment. Mr. Mark Kestisher, it is my pleasure to finally have you on So Much to Talk About. Pleasure to know you, sir. And I'm glad that you and your family are safe and uh, glad that you're that you're out there, you know, presenting these games uh, at such a high level. And then hopefully the fans will, you know, trickle into the arenas and everything. And we can probably buy the playoffs, maybe get get a 50 percent capacity at least, hopefully. That's what I'm hoping, and hopefully all the broadcasters will be on site pretty soon. Mm -hmm. Great, and we'll get as close to normal as we can. And Nabate, I can't thank you enough for thinking oh, of me to have you on your show. You. It's always been great uh, to have your friendship, and uh, I look forward to seeing you down the line. Yes, sir. I appreciate you, and uh, thank you all for watching so much to talk about. Have a wonderful evening. Bye-bye. God bless. Mm -hmm.